Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, verse 37 through 39 brings us to an interesting crossroad. And from the way that I see it, there's three ways that we can interpret these verses. Number one, these verses are speaking about the characteristic of the papacy. Number two, these verses are referring to France, the power that removed the papacy from its seat. And then number three, these verses aren't referring to France or the papacy, but a brand new power that has yet to be introduced into the Daniel 11 narrative. Now let's look at each individual scenario. We can logically look at these verses and say that this was indeed the papacy. Because when we look at the God of their fathers, if we say that we're talking about the Romans and the Romans who were now Catholic, the God of their fathers was the pagan gods. And thus we can say that the God of their fathers was the God of the pagans. We can also say that the desire of women refers to the Roman Catholic priest who weren't allowed to get married. And we can say that they had no regard for any God because the papacy placed itself in the position of God. And thus we can say that they had no regard for any other God. However, if this is talking about the papacy, we'd have to ask ourselves, why is the Bible still going through the characteristics of the papacy when the papacy fell in verse 36? Then we'd have to ask ourselves, why is it even talking about marriage in the first place? When we look at the construct of verse number 37, we see that it begins talking about deities. It's talking about the God of their fathers. And then it ends talking about him magnifying himself above every other God. And then smack in the middle of these two bookends is talking about marriage. Ladies and gentlemen, of all the things that we can say about the papacy, and trust me when I say this, the priest not being able to marry is one of the least. I mean, relatively speaking, for a power that has incorporated pagan traditions and infused them with Christian doctrines, for a power that historically has stopped its believers from reading the scriptures, from a power that has actually persecuted those that didn't recognize its authority, the fact that its priests couldn't get married is like the jaywalking of sins. Now there is logic to this actually being the papacy, but from my studies and from my vantage point, ladies and gentlemen, this ain't the papacy. Now, another scenario that has become popular within my denomination is the idea that verses 37 to 39 refer to France. And this is actually very logical because if we think about it, France was the power that for all intents and purposes, ended the reign of, or the civil reign of the papacy. And what makes this idea even more logical is that before the fall of the papacy, France legislated atheism into its laws. And thus we can say that because France legislated atheism and because the majority of France's existence, it was a Christian nation, we can say that because of this new legislation of atheism, this new religion of atheism, we can say that it no longer regarded the God of its fathers. It has also been revealed that during this stint of France's existence as an atheistic nation, they also made it easy for individuals to get a divorce. And because they made it easy and because the divorce rate, you know, uh, spiked up, we can also say that they had no desire for women. What I'm saying to you is that it is very logical for verses 37 through 39 to refer to France. But what I also must reveal to you is that there are reasons that verses 37 through 39 are not referring to France. And I'm going to give you those reasons right now. Considering that France was an atheistic nation prior to the fall of the papacy, in my view, in my opinion, France should have been introduced before the fall of the papacy, not after the fall of the papacy. What we must understand is that France was atheistic for a short period of time prior to the fall of the papacy. And if this verse is describing the actions of a specific nation 
at a specific time in history, then this verse should have, or excuse me, this account should have been mentioned prior to the fall of the papacy. Remember, the fall of the papacy occurred in 1798, but the legislation of atheism occurred four to five years before the fall of the papacy. Thus, we can't have verse 36 referring to the fall of the papacy in 1798, and then verse 37 referring to the atheistic laws of France in 1793. If Daniel 11 is what we think it is, a timeline of chronological events, then you can't have the fall of the papacy being introduced prior to the French Revolution. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, there are some who actually teach that the fall of the papacy didn't occur until verse 40. And for those individuals who believe that, we'll address you in next week's study. But for now, let's get back to our understanding or our present theory on verse number 37 regarding France being this power. And now let's deal with this desire of women. And we have to ask ourselves a question. If the desire of women refers to France making it easy to divorce, the question now remains is, well, is it only men that were divorcing? Weren't women also divorcing? I mean, doesn't divorce take two? You see, according to the historical record, even when they made divorce harder to obtain, women continue to outnumber men as petitioners in divorce cases. Now, if my understanding of this article is correct, then shouldn't verse 37 say, nor the desire for women and men? Now, here is something I want you to really think about. When we look at Revelation 13, which parallels Daniel chapter 11, and we look at verse number 10, which speaks of the fall of the papacy. Notice how it introduces the fall of the papacy. It says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, who was the power that took down the papacy here in Revelation chapter 13? It's the same power that took the papacy down in Daniel chapter 11. It was France. But notice, Revelation 13 doesn't go into France. It's, it's mentioning it passively, but it doesn't continue speaking about France. It goes on and it skips over France and goes into another power. And we'll talk about that in another study. But understanding here that Revelation 13 reveals the fall of the papacy, but doesn't go into the details of the power that made the papacy fall. And what we must understand is that Daniel chapter 11 does the same exact thing. It goes into the fall of the papacy, but it doesn't go into the power that precipitated that fall. So, so now we have to ask the question, if Daniel 11, 37 through 39 is not speaking about France, if Daniel 11, 37 through 39 is not speaking about the papacy, then who is it speaking about? It's speaking about the Ottoman Empire. You see, the Ottoman Empire rose up in 1299 and became one of the most dominant superpowers of its time. It would conquer much of the East, including Western Asia. It would conquer Northern Africa and Southeastern Europe, including Constantinople. Now, I know what you're thinking. If Verses 37 through 39 is talking about the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman Empire began in 1299. Well, that was prior to the fall of the papacy. So the same rules that I applied to France should also apply to the Ottoman Empire. Thus, what we're saying is, shouldn't the Ottoman Empire be introduced prior to the fall of the papacy in verse number 36? Correct. However, the difference in my interpretation is that verse 37 is not detailing a specific event in history. Placing France as the power in verses 37 through 39 forces us to place France within a specific event that occurred at a specific time, the time when France was an atheistic power. Because we're placing France within a specific event, which occurred in a specific time, that forces us to place this event sometime prior to the fall of the papal power. 
However, if we place the Ottoman Empire as the power between verses 37 through 39, it doesn't place us within a specific time frame. It doesn't place us within a specific event. Thus, verse 37 is simply giving us a description of the Ottoman Empire, a description that was true before the fall of the papacy and a description that was true after the fall of the papacy. Furthermore, what we also must understand is that had the Bible introduced the Ottoman Empire within verses 30 through 36, which was designated to the Papal Roman Empire, this most likely would have caused confusion because the Papal Roman Empire never really got into conflicts with the Ottoman Empire. There was a time where there was a holy alliance, but for the most part, Papal Rome's claim to fame, if I can call it that, is the persecution of the saints. Papal Rome's claim to fame is not a civil act, but it's more of religious acts. Thus, we can understand God's logic in introducing the Ottoman Empire after the fall of Papal Rome because the Ottoman Empire would last, outlast the Papal Roman Empire for 124 more years, even though it wasn't what it used to be. Now, the question is, how did the Ottomans not have regard for the God of their fathers? Now, we must first understand that the Ottoman Empire was a Muslim nation. However, what you must understand is that Allah wasn't their original God. You see, what we must understand is that the Ottoman Empire originated in Turkey. Turkey was also called Asia Minor. Now, when we read Revelation and when John the Revelator writes to the seven churches which are in Asia, what you have to know is that Asia here was Asia Minor. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the seven churches originated from Turkey. Thus, we understand that Turkey was originally, or those in Turkey were originally Christian. Thus, we understand that their original God was Jehovah, not Allah. Thus, we understand the Ottomans no longer regarded Jehovah, the God of their fathers. Now, what is this desire of women thing about? Now, I've studied this for a little while and as of recently, I've actually changed my understanding or my view of this verse. And when we look at this particular phrase in scripture, I believe the phrase is better suited as the woman that's desired. I believe it should be the desired woman or the woman that is blessed. And when we look at this woman that is desired when it comes to worship, there's only one deity, female deity, that comes to mind. Notice what the Bible says in Jeremiah 7, 18. It says, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Again, in Jeremiah 44, 19, it says, And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the woman or the woman deity that was desired. But now we have a problem here. And this is why it is important for us to understand the time frame, the time continuum that we are dealing with within Daniel chapter 11. It is also why we can't be going backwards and forwards in Daniel chapter 11 because we don't have because every error has its own intricacies that we must understand. And what we must understand is that because we're dealing within the time frame of the Ottoman Empire rising to power within at 1299 and sometime before its fall, you know, which lasted even after the fall of the papacy, we understand that because we're dealing within that time frame, paganism was on the decline. That's right. 
So because we're paganism was on the decline, it seems a little strange that we would be dealing with the queen of heaven when really most of the Roman empire and the surrounding empires, paganism had diminished greatly. So why are we focusing on the queen of heaven? So now we have to ask ourselves the question, if it wasn't the queen of heaven, this pagan deity that was the desired woman that was being worshiped, well, what other woman was being worshiped within the dark ages, within the middle ages? The Virgin Mary. Now do you see why it's important for us to understand the error that we're dealing with? Because we know that we're dealing with the dark ages and that paganism was you know, seriously declined by this time, we understand that there has to be another woman that is desired by all. And we must understand is that in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages, the papacy venerated the Virgin Mary as the mother of God. And thus we understand that even though the Catholics say that they don't worship Mary, they clearly revere Mary. And in this reverence they have for Mary, they treat her as a goddess. And now we see that because they pray to her, that they bow down to her. That, and it is no, it should be no coincidence to us that she is also called the queen of heaven. And it is in this manner that we can see that Mary was elevated to a goddess-like role. And it is also in this manner that we can now see that it is the Virgin Mary that was the woman that was desired in the territories that the Ottoman Empire conquered. But now here's the clincher, ladies and gentlemen, because verse 37 then says, he shall not regard any God. Now, how can this be a Muslim empire? There's, if there's one thing we know about Muslim nations is they have regard for Allah. Now, here's where we must remember that in order to be a student of prophecy, we also have to be a student of history because history tells us that the Ottoman Empire was a different type of empire. Unlike many superpowers that preceded it, that often tried to convert its individuals to its own religion, the Ottoman Empire didn't worry themselves with trying to convert those it, it conquered to be a Muslim or convert them to Islam. You see, the Ottoman Empire had a system called the millet system. And this millet system allowed each territory that it conquered to maintain its own religion. It even allowed them to elect its own spiritual leaders. And this is why the Ottoman Empire didn't really have much resistance when it went to conquer these territories. It's because the Ottomans didn't really have any criteria for those that worship the Jehovah, the God of their fathers. They didn't really particularly care if individuals venerated Mary, the desired woman. And in essence, they didn't really care what particular gods you had as long as you paid your taxes. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now, before we understood that verses 37 to 38 was talking about the Ottoman Empire, we saw this as a contradiction. Notice verse 37 said he had no regard for any God. Then verse 38 says he honored the God of forces. Well, that's a contradiction. How is he having no regard for any God in verse 37, but then honoring a God in verse number 38. Now that we understand that this is the Ottoman Empire, now that we understand that the Ottomans had the millet system, we can see that in the territories that they conquered, which was, you know, Catholic territories and different territories, they didn't have a regard, they didn't have a criteria for those that you worship. However, in their particular territory, which was in somewhere in Turkey where they originated from, they worshiped a particular God. This God was called the God of forces. So what is this force? May the force be with you. Yeah, I don't think that that's the type of force that we're talking about. You see, this word force is typically translated in Daniel as a fort, 
a fortified place, a defense, or a fortress. Now ask yourselves a question. Why does a city need to be fortified? Why does a city need to be a fortress? What we must understand is that a city needed to be a fortress or it needed to be fortified in times of war. And even though every religion has fought wars, we must understand what God said specifically about Ishmael, the father of the Islamic nations. In Genesis 16, 12, he says, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, if we can take this verse as a principle, we can see that the Turkish people, even though they weren't descendants directly of Ishmael, but their faith, their religion was descended from Ishmael. And according to Genesis, these descendants will be constantly at war with others and others will be constantly at war with them. And now we can see why Daniel declared that a people who were historically involved in jihad as worshiping the God of a fortress or a God of a fortified place, the God of the fortified cities, which is, ladies and gentlemen, Allah. It was this God, ladies and gentlemen, that was honored with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Strange here can represent form. And thus we understand that Allah, who really was came about in the 7th century, Allah here can represent a foreign God, a God that they didn't really know beforehand. The Ottomans, as we discussed earlier, ruled over a large territory. They ruled over many. But what we must understand is that in 19, around 1922, their empire would fall and it would be divided for the gain of others. What we must understand is that after World War I, the vast conglomeration of territories that formed the Ottoman Empire would be divided into several new states by the British and the French. And just as the Ledger of Truth prophesied, around 1922, the Ottoman Empire was totally dismantled. And today, the only remainder of the Ottoman Empire is located in their original, you know, their original place, which is Turkey. Now, the question is, why is the Ottoman Empire even relevant? Why is the Ledger of Truth even involving itself in mentioning the Ottoman Empire. Well, what you must understand is that in order to understand the end of the world, you must understand that we are out of time. And I'm going to reveal why the Ottoman Empire is relevant in next week's episode of the Daniel 11 Chronicles. Next week on the Daniel 11 Chronicles. Thank <laughs> you.